Uh, okay, so the, the purpose of the Game Changers panel is to explore issues not previously explored or to explore in more detail some of the other issues that we've already touched on today. Uh, so since we just kind of came off the electric vehicle panel, why don't we start off with uh, a little bit of other information about electric vehicles. Uh, and I'd like for Christian Okonski to kind of give us a start off here because he's got a, an interesting take on electric motors. Matter of fact, one of the quotes I heard you say previously, a quote from you, I, thought, I believe I got this right, was over 50% of the world's energy is consumed by electric motors. <laughs> electric motor systems, that's right. Thanks, Dan. So, yeah, so one of the interesting things, what KLD does is we do electric motor system technology. So we do motor battery controller. Uh, our first application is the electric vehicles. As a matter of fact, our battery, we partnered with Samsung, their strategic partner for the actual chemistry itself. You know, I'm excited about the Game Changer panel because I truly believe that we can make a difference out there. And the way to do that, if you look at electric vehicle technology today, KLD's created a platform. Uh, that pl platform is the drivetrain. We have other companies out there, Gordon Murray, for example, is an F1 designer for McLaren. He designed a chassis platform. You take those two and you actually create the, the building blocks of foundation for electric vehicles. I believe today that a company out there who wants to be an electric vehicle company, not the, not the GMs, you know, not the Volkswagens, not those groups, but we're talking about other companies, you could go out there and $30 million create an electric vehicle company. What does that do for us up here today? Well, I'll tell you what that really does for us. What that does is it creates hundreds of electric vehicle companies just like there was hundreds of electric, sorry, hundreds of internal combustion companies in the early 1900s. What does that do? That drives down cost. Cost drives up acceptance. And then what can you do? Then you have electric vehicles that are on the grid at noon at the employers, right? And all of a sudden you can get grid stabilization. You have companies like Westlake Energy that can be out there doing distributed power for small communities and these can make a big difference. So I'm a big proponent of this platform technology and I believe that these people right here are people that can make that happen. Mm -hmm. Nisha, I saw you kind of nod your head a little bit. I know NRG does some marketing of electric vehicle storage, right? Energy that's stored in electric vehicles. What do you have to say about that? Um, so, yeah, we have, we have a business um, around uh, electric vehicles. It's uh, branded under EVgo, uh, where we provide, um, essentially, that kind of stems originally from our activities as a retail electric provider. So if somebody is driving electric vehicles, they're going to want to be consuming electricity to charge up their cars. And you know, we have a variety of different kind of rate plans to uh, end, plus you know, build out of charging infrastructure that provides um, customers with the ability to um, you know, fill up, essentially. Uh, now, as part of that, we're also looking at other business opportunities that result from the fact that we've got infrastructure. So looking at putting storage, for example, right next to the charging stations and then using that for additional purposes to kind of manage ancillary services and things like that on the grid. We heard from the electric vehicle panel that one of the things that's limiting uptake of rechargeable electric vehicles is the location of charging stations. Uh, I've heard that there's about a million charging stations worldwide. That doesn't really compare to the number of vehicles yet. Uh, you'll you'll, you'll be also be interested to know that Austin is one of the top five locations for charging stations. Um, but I also heard that uh, in North Carolina, they uh, charge EV owners an extra $100 a year mm -hmm. to make up for the taxes that they <laughs> don't collect off of gasoline, right? Um, Mark, uh, as, a, as a legislator, we're going to blame you for that one. Uh, what do you think about that? What do, you, do, you think it, do you think it's fair for electric vehicle owners to be charged a surtax? Well, he, well I, no. But, but let me say this. When I, when I joined the legislature, when I became a member in 2005, there was a big debate in this community about toll roads. I and mean, there still is, but it was really fierce then. And there was this slide on everybody's, on the transportation advocates PowerPoint presentation that said the gas tax is going to decline and we have to find other ways to fund the roads. And in 2005, I, I and I don't think most people, found that to be credible. And then, the recession hit, and all of a sudden people became really conscious. The, the recession hit simultaneously with 3 and $4 a gallon gasoline. Uh, and people became really conscious of what they were spending on gasoline. And 
I think vehicle miles traveled reduced and um, people started being cost conscientious about the consumption of the new vehicles they purchased, about the fuel economy. And now I think that's actually a thing that governments have to worry about, is that can they fund road infrastructure in a world that's evolving toward more energy efficient, or at least gasoline efficiency? And um, so, so I'm, I don't dismiss the problem they're trying to solve. I certainly think given where we are, given the social benefits of electric cars and given the, where we are in their nascent development, now's not the time to be imposing special itemized taxes on them. Mm -hmm. what, uh, Andres, I'm sure you have some opinions about G to V and V to G and taxes. Yeah, and I, I, personally, I personally dream of the day where I can you know, buy me a truck the, that I can run my house from it. Uh, so hopefully it'll happen sooner than later and it won't be you know, a very expensive truck. But I concur with Christian and his uh, uh, angle of uh, economies of scale. So, so why not accelerate you know, this uh, semi-knockdown kit strategy that he's talking about that others could be embracing? So that you know, there could be 10, 10 or 100 Teslas, and what would that do to, again, volume and parts and components, and and, and if utilities were to embrace that. So here's here's a game changer. For example, if I if I if I owned a utility and I was not regulated, so that's impossible. But let's pretend that I own a utility and I'm not regulated. Uh, I would actually, because I can borrow money very inexpensively, I would actually buy all the electric vehicles, and I would lease them back to my customers. Mm. And then mm. because I own the vehicle, then I can do whatever I want with V2G and, and, and G2V. Sounds like you're trying to drive the agenda of the conversation. Let me flip a couple of pages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, let me flip back. I, I know Andres has a thing about uh, moving towards a telecom model or a cable model for uh, electric uh, utilities where electric utilities or other, other providers own the devices that are on the, on the other side of the meter, for example. Um. Yeah, I just have one comment, the, the North Carolina tax. So it's interesting, because uh, at KLD, we work a lot actually selling more overseas than we do in the United States right now. Um, but what we're seeing overseas is there's a lot of governments who actually subsidize gasoline. So they are happy to do electric because they don't have to pay that subsidy. Malaysia, for example, huge subsidies on petrol. So they're dying to get into electric because they want to stop paying the subsidies. And so they actually, by just having electric, make a lot more money. So there's a lot of countries like this. Not everyone's the United States is number one you know, producer of oil in the world. So, <laughs> so it's something interesting. Have you heard of the, have you heard the concept of the deal, Department of Energy E-Gallon, or the, the, the equation of dollars per electric versus dollars per gasoline gallon. I, I saw the other day that the DOE e gallon is about $1.14 to the amount of electricity that equals a gallon of gas in driving range. Mm -hmm. um, that's about a third of what we pay now for gasoline. So certainly seems like a compelling alternative if we can get the range up, right? The range is the big problem, right? If we have more efficient engines, maybe we can get the range up. If we can have better batteries like Tesla's Gigafactory, Maybe we can have better storage as well. Have you all, heard, have you all talked about uh, or you heard about Tesla's Gigafactory? They're looking to locate that either in Texas or California, or mm -hmm. Texas or Arizona, maybe, maybe New Mexico. Uh, spur, talk about a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're able to get batteries at, in, in mass and at quantity, what would that do to the wind and uh, solar sectors? <clears throat> I'll jump in. I think one of the things that we haven't spoken about today with respect to uh, electric vehicles is when you plug in, you're getting the electricity from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from a variety of different resources to, based on, depending on where you are, Texas or Canada or Malaysia, as the case may be. And uh, there are so many um, efficiencies that have yet to be tapped when it comes to utilizing and leveraging um, storage with renewables, with uh, technologies um, that are 
uh, better for integrating systems for at the ISO level. We haven't even uh, touched uh, today on uh, what it would be like if we stopped uh, operating in smaller grids, and I'm not talking about Texas because I know <laughs> Texas is not a small grid, but there are other parts of the country uh, where we operate in small grids and, and there's this tension between, you know, uh, adding more renewable energy um, and what that means for utility companies and, you know, you automatically need storage and I would say a game changer is to take storage with basic engineering um, that would allow us to add a heck of a lot more renewables with a little bit more storage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll expand on that just really quickly. In mm -hmm. Spain, for example, they have a desk that specifically manages renewable energy. They have obviously a lot of wind, they have a lot of solar and some hydro, and what they have done is they have maximized the potential output and management and capacity resources and demand response by integrating and optimizing the renewable energy desk with their traditional power desks as well. And I think all of that goes together hand in hand with storage as well. I've seen the graph from Spain's, I think it's their equivalent of the Department of Energy, where they have a significant amount of renewables in there and they kind of show a real time graph. A lot of it is wind, which is a little bit surprising to me because wind is so bursty, right? It's hard to control. Uh, Nisha, do you have any, any comments about the, uh, the wind versus solar versus uh, hydro? Um. I'll speak more from kind of personal experience, having spent three years as an energy storage developer um, working on issues, uh, particularly out in West Texas, where you know we're blessed with a lot of wind in Texas, and um, it was overwhelming the transmission system. And so, you know, I've had experience as an energy storage developer, really working with wind, and also had experience as a solar power developer, um, trying to develop a technology. Uh, developed projects that were a, a technology which, um, interestingly enough, um, was producing power at peak times of the day. And a difference in five years and the demand for storage was so much higher in terms of you need to provide storage with this as opposed to five years previously when I was actually trying to develop storage to deal with gusty, erratic, wind that comes during the wrong time of day, and we were really trying to show how you could get it from off-peak to on-peak. So the point of that story is to say that I think that the whole way we think about energy storage has changed. So when I was doing energy storage development and was trying to take wind from off-peak and deliver it on-peak, it was really more about kind of arbitraging the value in terms of time of day. Right now, when um, people are t talking about adding energy storage to help us integrate all these massive amounts of solar, for example, they actually come at the right time of day. It comes sort of. I mean, it comes kind of during the peak time, uh, not exactly at the peak. But it's really more about kind of the, the micromanagement of renewables and kind of the, you know, kind of managing things kind of down at the distribution level, having things that can, um, can, can kind of really serve to, to balance and kind of fill in as opposed to in bulk move power that's generated from off-peak onto on-peak. So again, I think it's, it's just really, um, and I, I really can't speak to hydro. I, mean, <laughs> I can't speak to hydro. Um, I, I, well, I we're in Texas, so we really don't care. Yeah, either. well, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it, it's just interesting to see how, how the way we're thinking about energy storage now has really got to do more with the whole kind of concept of ancillary services and regulation and being able to provide um, power when it kind of aggregated together to meet the needs um, that we might see on the grid. Do you think it's fair to say that cheap batteries plus solar power may uh, reduce, the, reduce the footprint of utilities? I think, I mean, sure. If you had cheap batteries and cheap solar, you would definitely reduce the footprint of utilities. But the thing is, we don't have cheap batteries and we don't have cheap solar, right? We have, certainly have cheaper solar and you can talk about how cheap solar is in Texas right now. Um, but we don't, we don't have cheap storage. So, so I think the, the thing that we'll end up having to look at that to me makes the most sense is where you've got storage deployed strategically at points in the grid 
when you start talking about strategic deployments of storage at points in the grid, you start talking about having to interact with the utilities. So, so, so I have a question for us, maybe. So what is cheap storage? What is the number to hit? Is it $1,000 per megawatt? I have no idea. Is it $600 per megawatt? Is it $100 per megawatt? What's the number? I have no idea. Well, let's Wait. help the audience because there's a, a bunch of startups and entrepreneurs out there. I mean, is there a number? Well, the number is different uh, based on the market, obviously. I mean, cheap Give solar. Me a range. Cheap solar in Texas would have to be very, very cheap. Um, you know, like when, five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, uh, cheap uh, storage is what I meant to say, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. was a Freudian <laughs> slip if there ever was one. Um, so I think you know it really depends on the market, and and I. I really don't like to generalize about markets because they are, can be so different. Mm -hmm. I think you know what you need to make storage work in California or PJM is very, very different than what you need in Texas. For example, in PJM, you know you might be able to take advantage of some very real, meaningful um, value in terms of capacity that you don't have here. Um, so I don't know what the number is for storage here. So, but I, okay. but I, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a very large user of energy. I'll tell you, it's. It's got to be at least the same price or lower than what we pay now. We get approached a lot. We try to do a lot of green stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it all costs more than what I pay today. And I know people go, it's, it's about the environment. It's about doing that kind of stuff. But also, we all have to compete worldwide with other <laughs> companies. So if we can't get renewable energies down where they're cost effective to what we do today, you're not going to get companies to switch because it's a business decision mm -hmm. that puts you at a disadvantage with the rest of the world. Okay. I hope this isn't too much of a tangent. One time I was invited <laughs> to speak to a group of high school <laughs> students at the University of Texas. They were visiting the University of Texas as part of a program where UT was bringing up students from South Texas to into this leadership development academy. and they. They asked me to come speak to a group of kids who had chosen, it was a week-long program, and these kids had chosen to spend their week working on an energy policy agenda, specifically renewable energy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got there expecting that these bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, 16 and 17-year-old kids wanted to talk about renewable energy because of their environmental ethos. <laughs> but this was a group of kids from uh, you know, socioeconomically challenged circumstances, and Almost all the kids who had chosen that policy track had chosen it because they wanted to figure out a way to reduce their family's utility bill. Mm -hmm. They, most of them actually told me that they worked after school and that the primary purpose of their extra income for the family was to pay the utility bill. Uh, and they were in a renewable energy, they had chosen renewable energy because to their minds, the, the logical assumption was that wind from the sun, that sorry, that electricity from the sun and the wind would be cheaper than having to dig coal out of the ground, transport it to a multi-billion dollar power plant, and generate electricity from it, or, that, or the same for natural gas. Well, I absolutely agree with you. I think the goal for the renewable energy community has to be to be cheaper. Yeah. And, I, and I will just add that it is. In many parts of the world, it is cheaper. In many parts of the world, you know, Sun Edison, we have a, the Eradication of Darkness project. We're also doing a lot of rural e electrification. And just to that point, m in many places, it is a sure. no-brainer. We are building a large uh, solar facility in Chile that will be merchant. It's a no-brainer. We are cheaper uh, in a lot of places. That may not necessarily be the case in Texas. Um, but, you know, having said that, some of the things that one might consider doing, you know, as uh, we sit here and talk about, you know, game changers, is really talk about cost reduction. And cost reduction in the U.S. is the only way, well, one of the only ways that we are going to achieve um, parity with the grid when it comes to alternative sources of energy. That can be through a variety of different ways. Um, we can get cost reductions through financing, whether it's through participating in public equity markets through yield vehicles, um, as NRG does, whether it's participating in debt markets through securitization. 
Um, it's also through the reduction of costs for uh, the construction of uh, large-scale solar facilities or wind facilities. Um, one of the things that we're doing is applying lean manufacturing principles to our uh, construction methodology so that we can reduce costs so that we can uh, make solar uh, more competitive um, as well. So, and that's not even, to, uh, you know, to touch on the subject of, of technology and the, the efficiencies that we can still gain from uh, just making daily, monthly, annual uh, benefits and, and increases to the efficiencies of modules as well and solar. You talk about large solar farms. That's one of the impact areas that uh, real estate ain't cheap. If you've got to have a large solar farm, you've got to buy the dirt. If you want to buy the cheap dirt, you've got to haul the power a long way. Uh, is, it, is distributed generation with solar, wind, and stuff like that feasible at less than utility scale? So I was not speaking about large. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the really great um, pilots that we've just completed is in New York on a rooftop. And it was to significantly decrease the um, uh, installation cost of a rooftop distributed generation facility. And, uh, you know, not for public consumption yet to say how much we saved, but it was so much that it made, uh, it opened an entire market to us in New York. Mm. That's, it's an interesting, it brings up another interesting topic. Is it possible to have power generated by buildings and homes rather than just solar panels placed on top of the homes? Or is it possible for the utility to own the solar panels that are placed on top of the homes? This goes back to Andre's question before. Uh, I mean, if I have a hailstorm and I need to replace my uh, roof, maybe the utility comes in and helps me with replacing the roof and it becomes solar and they own the solar and they manipulate the solar. Is that something that's, uh, that would, would something like that be a game changer of a business model? It would. Uh, yeah, I'll take that even though I have nothing to do with roof, <laughs> roofs. But, so, so it's interesting because what you're really talking about is getting different sectors to work together, mm -hmm. right? And when you look at that, you talk about, when you just talked about batteries and storage, you know, can you make batteries cheaper? Well, how about reuse of batteries instead of making them cheaper? You take materials and reuse them, mm -hmm. right? So let's just take the EV industry. A battery in an EV uh, electric vehicle, once it's 70 or 80% capacity, can no longer be used because you can't pull enough current out of it, right? Well, it can be used in energy storage. So imagine Andreas and his new Westlake Energy, which I really like, and I'm not trying to plug your stuff. But <laughs> anyway, so, so he has this Westlake Energy, and we do long-term contracts where we sell him batteries, reuse batteries that he stores 70% capacity is great for him. He doesn't care. He just sits it on the ground, right? And all of a sudden it costs him 45 cents a watt hour versus 80, 85 cents. Mm -hmm. And 45 cents in the vehicle. So you've now half the cost on both ends and it's, and it's, it's viable. So it's not just make things cheaper. It's better use of them and get all these people working together on different platforms to make them work. Right. Anyway, that's one of the that's going to, you know, listening to all this, I'm sorry since my background isn't full energy, but you talk about sharing and stuff. That's going to be a, a, a very difficult sell to businesses, I think, at first, because we don't know that. You think, if I need power, I just plug in. I don't know I have these big utility distributions back behind the building. People don't think about that. All they think about is it's easy to get to. Now you want to get financial types and people whose their main business is in energy to start looking at cogeneration, bringing in facilities. We've looked at bringing in uh, solar, but there's not enough real estate. It looks good. People drive by and we have <coughs> solar out there and they all go great. It barely, uh, it barely dents. Mm -hmm. You can't even tell it on our electric bill mm -hmm. if we were to do it. So you, because you can't, have, you can't get enough of the panels out there? You can't get enough panels. There's not enough land because we're locked in. Now, if you can build them, but where we're at, you can't get now, do you want to redo all of the building? You could, but that's a huge capital cost. Do you want me to replace all the equipment that's been in these buildings for years <coughs> to work with all this new stuff? Yes, we can, but it's a huge capital cost. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the cost of generating the power, it's the cost that I have to spend to get to that, to move over. Mm -hmm. How do I also do that? Because that stuff's been in place for a while. Can I ask a question, and I apologize if you don't know the answer, that would be perfectly fine, but do you guys at Samsung, do you pay a time of day price for electricity, or is it levelized? Does anybody in Austin pay they, a time of day price? We, they might, we they, they, may not. they have a demand yeah. charge. I think you have a demand charge, right? Yeah, okay. I don't, I'm, I'm just learning all this. That's so okay. So here's why I ask, because when I mention, you know, it ought, I think the goal for renewable energy has to be to beat the bogey. It has to be the cheapest alternative. Mm -hmm. 
The question is, are there things in the market that make it not look as cheap as it might actually be? Absolutely. Right? And, and time of, for solar, at least, time of day pricing would go a long way to making it a lot more cost competitive. Now, time of day pricing has all kinds of other regulatory and social implications. Mm -hmm. But on an Apple, to compare apples to apples pricing, you, you know, we, we compare a levelized price of energy when we know that the cost of producing energy at night <coughs> is a lot less than during the day. And we, as consumers, pay the same in the middle of the afternoon, same rate as we do in the middle of the night. Solar is profoundly disadvantaged by that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so when I say, you know, the bogey's got to be to be the cheapest alternative on the grid, you also have to look at anything in the marketplace that distorts the ability to achieve that. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. But, but a high, for, for somebody like Samsung that's running a factory? It's not going to be enough, yeah. It, well, no, but it's, uh, if we had to pay different rates depending on time of day usage, that would be a penalty, a huge penalty. Mm -hmm. Because we pretty much are constant use 24 hours a day. Yeah. So, and, and that's the way they're managed. They, get, they sign a long-term contract a long -term. with a fixed rate. Yeah. And that they have the amount of charges, they go above it. Yeah. Do you have co-generation facilities at Samsung? Mm -hmm. No, actually, uh, being not from the U.S. and, and a different, uh, when we built our factory, a different view on electricity, we have no coal generation. Mm -hmm. We take everything from Austin Energy. Uh, and We have, have deals with them to do it. Now, looking back, can you do it better or cheaper? I don't know. One thing that we run into, and, and again, we're not specialists in, in energy, but two weeks ago when that thunderstorm came through, we took a sag of... I think 30% for four cycles, and I'm still learning all this, it took us two days to recover from that. Mm -hmm. We had a bunch of equipment that alarmed because it's that sensitive. And so when you get into all this new stuff, game changing, how we're gonna move forward, <laughs> and you walk in and we're like, we're nervous enough with what we have <laughs> with just that little bit of impact. So how do you do that kind of change? A small well, perturbation. I, I would argue system. that it shouldn't be for you to think about. <laughs> I would argue that you should think about um, energy like the average retail customer does for no more than eight minutes a year. That's what paying the and, bill and it's not your job to think about it. <laughs> it's, it's our job to figure that out for mm -hmm. you and to present you with a package that is sensible. Now, Samsung Austin may not be the ideal candidate for these types of technologies, but there are many... Um, consumers, uh, commercial and industrial, where they are, and there are many residential that are. And one of the things that I heard today, and I've heard this a lot um, in the news lately, is the issue of the death spiral with the utilities mm -hmm. and, you know, solar is coming and we all have to run. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really important for utilities to consider is that there are companies out there that are willing to partner um, with utilities to use what's already existing um, so that there isn't that, um, you know, uh, we go in and we take your customer from a distributed scale. There's a, we'll work with you. What we get out of that is the stickiness of your customer. Mm -hmm. We get that customer for as long as you serve them. And what you get out of that is this nice packaged bow so that Austin Energy or somebody else may not work as well in Austin Energy's territory can go to Samsung or some other uh, consumer and say, here are your five choices. What would you like? Mm -hmm. Don't think about it for more than eight minutes. <laughs> we, we heard from some of the... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I just <laughs> want to say that, you know, this is a conversation that we're having in a regulated utility territory, mm -hmm. right? I mean, Austin Energy, vertically integrated. They do the generation they, all the way to supplying the customer. And, you know... If you live in Austin, you get your power from Austin Energy, mm -hmm. and Austin Energy tells you how you get it, right? Other parts of Texas, it's a competitive market, and that's where, you know, where some of the innovations or the game-changing, I guess, that has to occur um, is probably around, actually, the bundling. So, for example, um, in other parts, of t in, 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 the, in the deregulated portion of ERCOT. Customers do have a choice as far as what kind of rate plan they get. They can sign up for, you know, the free nights and weekends rate, 
or they can sign up for the levelized billing rate. They can sign up for something where you know, they get a rate for something that's uh, higher during the on-peak in, in return for getting a low off-peak. And it really has to do with the diversity of retailers that are out there to supply these types of options. Now, here's the thing. If the retailer has signed up a customer to you know, some type of rate, then you know, the retailer also then has the ability, potentially, to figure out, okay, so how could I match solar or some other type of product, you know, CHP or backup generation or something, such that the package together, you know, makes sense for the customer and then it makes sense for the retailer as well, who effectively, when they sign up that customer and says, okay, listen, I'm going to charge you a flat rate around the clock, you know, we wear the risk of whatever's happening in the wholesale market with prices spiking to $5,000 a megawatt hour, right? So, you know, to the extent that we can use some type of on-site customer generation solution, right, to help us manage that risk, I mean, you can create a win-win there, but, yeah, There's at the same time, it's, 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 it's hard to nevertheless make the economics and One of the, 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 the panel earlier today that had the utility executives on there, I don't, I don't want to pin Wade Smith of AEP down, but what I wrote down, they were talking about, they were talking about a SWOT analysis, and, and what I wrote down was when Wade Smith got to the T, which is the threat part of the SWOT analysis, he said, he said we're a regulated entity. So he said, the, he used the regulated thing as a threat, as part of the threat, which I thought was fascinating. No, that's not right, Wade, you can meet me outside and we'll square it up after the fact. <laughs> Uh, but then Gary Ratcliffe, Gary Ratcliffe echoed it in a subsequent panel, and he said the regulatory structure is a disincentive. Mm -hmm. is that, well, their uh, hands are tied to innovate, I mm -hmm. think, is, from my perspective, from the outside looking in, it means that oftentimes if you're a regulated entity, your hands are tied to innovate. Mm -hmm. And without innovation in an environment that's constantly changing and innovating, it is a threat. So, you know, perhaps from that perspective. Well, it's also a question of competition, too. I mean, one of the reasons that solar is cheap is because there's a hell of a lot of solar companies that are out there that are competing with each other to bring down the costs, right? I mean, it, and you know just how brutal the market is and how thin the margins are for people who are in the solar business. And, and again, it's because it's competition that's driving it down. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where a lot of that innovation comes from. Does that come in, you know, kind of a regulated utility kind of rate of return, no competition forcing kind of innovation, mm -hmm. right? The reason I think that solar is <clears throat> a threat to the traditional regulated utility model is it introduces these elements of competition into their protected rate base that weren't there before because they didn't used to have to compete for how are we gonna serve electricity to our customers? So now, we're, we're in that so, market, So you're advocating for competition. You want more of it. I, I'm a, I, I work for a company that has a big competitive retail comp <laughs> position. Yes, I'm, I, in general, I, I, I do advocate for competition. <laughs> but, but there are workarounds, and I'm not advocating for one or the other, and I think markets are different. And saying that you can you know, get to Nebraska to deregulate any time in the next, you know, before I die, it may not, never happen. So, I mean, there are ways to innovate within that, and hence, uh, you know, the fact that I don't believe that it's a death spiral. I think it's a growth spiral, and if utilities really want, um, there are companies out there that can help them provide solutions to their customers so they're not constantly losing load. I heard another speaker today say that tech, not, I don't remember who this was, but if it was Wade Smith, you can, you can square that up with me in the parking lot also. Uh, uh, technology standards and policy are the three key issues faced by utilities, and they all have equal weight. Mm -hmm. That was in our panel on mm -hmm. Smart Grid. Yeah, yeah. You agree with that? I have a, I have a quote from Nisha that, that uh, disagrees with that, so I'm waiting for her to speak up. But do you agree with that? We'll start this way and move that way, and if we well, don't get there, I mean, I'll use you, the quote. You, can, you cannot ignore the construct of how you make money. So again, regulated utilities are in a world of cost plus. They borrow money cheaply to deploy assets. So they have a challenge with a service uh, model where they're going to outsource things because that's now how they borrow money and they make greater return. So this is why utilities, for example, don't use pervasively telecom carriers infrastructure. 
and they build their own infrastructure, let alone security and all these other issues, but it's the capital construct. They, say, they make money on returns on assets deployed. They don't make money on spending money on renting things from people. So, so you, you need to transform the construct because utilities are great citizens and stewards of, they do what they're told because they're regulated, right? So we cannot ignore that, I would say. I think I, just to skip over here, I mean, you know, we also make money on assets that are deployed, as does Sun Edison, as does Samsung, right? The, the, the difference is that, you know, if we deploy capital, we don't have a guaranteed rate of return, right? So we have to take what the customer is willing to pay us if, they're, if we're mm -hmm. going to sign them up for a long-term contract, or we have to take what the market's going to pay us if we're just going to take a market position. Um, so I think it's, it's important to, by the way, just a reference to an earlier comment, I think it's important to understand the difference between competition and deregulation. Right. You can have competition without having deregulation. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, want, I think I want to take the position that technology has the potential to be more significant than the other two policy and standards. Mm. I mean, I, just because I grew up in this era. Is that Google technology, talking or is that Mark's I don't think talking? so. No, I think I went to Google because I okay. believe that. Uh, I, you know, and, and I'll give you an example of where the two meet. The, but just if you just look at the arc of history in the last 40 years, I just look at fracking. Let's call fracking a technology. It is. Has it been more disruptive? Has it been more game changing than standards and policy? Now, obviously, the three are intertwined, mm -hmm. but I think technology is the driver. Uh, I'll give you an example that isn't that is a little bit off the the path, but this is one that relates to the job I do now. At Google, at Google Fiber, we're trying to make the internet a hundred times faster. When I first got to Google, on my first day, I had a calendar notice pop up that said I had a meeting in X room with Y person. I walk into X room, there is no person there. There is a big screen TV, high definition. And the person that I was meeting with was a thousand miles away and appeared to me in high definition, in life size, in real time. And for the first five minutes of that meeting, it felt a little weird. Was it Sheldon Cooper? It wasn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the, by the second five minutes, those video conferences, when you do them in high def mm -hmm. it, with very good broadband connecting them, those, by the second five minutes, they feel normal. And by the second day I was at Google, that type of video conference technology had become indispensable to me. By the second day, it is a profoundly disruptive technology. When we have to travel, when I have to fly somewhere for Google, I go to this internal corporate website and the first screen of it says, going somewhere, have you tried video conferencing? And half the time I'm like, yeah, that's right. I could just video conference this. It's different than video conferencing the way we do from our laptops in hotel rooms on you know, slow internet connections, pixelated pictures, you know, asynchronicity between voice and video. When you do it in high def, in real time, in life size, it is like being there. Do you and think, it do you eliminates think a ton of Even problems. in the regulated industry, do you think the technology is the biggest disruptor? I, that's outside my expertise, I don't know. But I, 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 I think that I think there are so many possibilities for how technology could, I, I admit that it hasn't yet, right? Like I, I started talking about this seven or eight years ago when I first got into politics thinking something is gonna be as transformative in energy as the internet was to IT and it's gonna change everything. And it hadn't happened yet. <coughs> but I would also say in the, in, during that time, there has been a lot of capital invested in a lot of promising technologies. Mm -hmm. I don't have good visibility into what the pipeline of those technologies looks like, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping. I, I do agree that there is one technology that is going to be incredibly disruptive that has been around for a long time, but it's now going to benefit from Moore's Law and innovation on all the things. And it's great, basically natural gas microturbines. Mm -hmm. And natural gas microturbines are highly more efficient on their small footprints to be delivered at commercial and industrial sites, even potentially homes, big homes, than they are in, in, you know, when you compare them to the big infrastructure. So 
So, you know, to the tune of 15 to 30 percent more efficient in terms of how they burn gas and how they generate electrons. So I think personally that we're witnessing DG with solar, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a, another set of technologies on DG that make the whole, you know, distributed. And what we were discussing in the smart grid panel and Dr. Amin went into where you have, again, the mainframe is not going to die. Central production is not going to die. That's the mainframe. And what we need is to create more PCs and laptops on the generation side, which are distributed generation, right? Electric vehicles is a form of that. Solar panels is a form of that. Natural gas turbines is a form of that. So I think distributed energy, microgrids, in concert with the utilities, it's really how this is going to happen, primarily because big customers need you know, time to market. They need to move fast. They have all these desires, and, and customers want choice and options and and, and better cost structures. And, and so the current construct that we live in uh, is limited uh, by that the reality of the business model. So that's why Tesla is building their own supercharging stations and you know, they're off the grid and, and, and EVgo is its own thing and, and you, you, they don't need to call a utility even though there are one to build that EVgo infrastructure thing. They could do it with solar panels and natural gas turbines and, and create a pseudo grid wherever they are, right? So, hmm. interesting. We're getting close to time, so if there's people that have questions, you want to make your way up to the microphone. I got one or two more topics that we can cover in the meantime here. Um, one of them is to touch on the fact that uh, it's getting to the point where I agree with the uh, speaker from Blue Bonnet earlier a tech outage is going to be worse than a power outage. If we get to this kind of a situation, the tech outage is going to be worse than the power outage. Uh, jobs. We heard that uh, Texas is the number one place for jobs, for green jobs, right? The IEEE says this, and we believe everything the IEEE says um, <laughs> because they're always right except on uh, wired equivalent privacy for uh, Wi-Fi, but that was another issue. Uh, what's more important, technical skills or the ability to change? Ability to change. Yeah. Ability to change. My, my, I, I'll, 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 I'll give you a, a quote from my mom. My mom mm -hmm. used to say to me and my, everybody in the house that adaptability was the highest form of intelligence. What's better, innovativeness and diverse work history or the ability to code and do a financial audit? Innovation. <laughs> <laughs> innovation? 100%. I heard innovation. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, yeah. innovation. I mean, one of the things, just to touch on that, is you know everything you just mentioned, Andres, Energy is an infrastructure business. That's right. You know, it's, it, there's not a lot of magic. Mm -hmm. um, we just have to do everything that we currently do a heck of a lot better. Mm -hmm. And that means innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation and efficiency. And efficiency. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, we got some, I think we got some questions over here. It's hard to see. Go ahead and step up to the mic. Hi, I'm Becky Harrison, and I'm with the Gridwise Alliance, and we focus on bringing folks together to talk about these issues. And one of my questions is, and we heard Masood talk about this, our, our, the electrification of our country has really driven our economy and driven our national security. So one of the things we've got to be careful of is that we don't screw it up while we're making this innovative change. And I think the challenge there is being a regulated industry, being that it is critical to our economy and critical to our national security as we do this, how do we do a better job of partnering the game changers with the industry in figuring out how to make it happen as fast as possible? Anybody, well, it's, have it's, it's other countries have done this before. It's not. Um... I, I think. I think. I think the challenge, Becky and Becky Harrison, used to run the grid of Progress Energy, and she's built a couple of things that are phenomenal. So uh, it, it, the problem is that the United States of America is really 50 countries when it comes to energy, as you know very well. And so uh, the White House and FERC, they can do whatever they want, but you know, FERC uh, and Wellenhoff may share with that. I don't know if he's in the audience now, but you know, ERCA doesn't get ruled by FERC. So, because Texas is different, so, <laughs> so we have all these construct challenges, right? So, but I think I think the answer is the answer is probably a, 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 a engineering wise a combination of both. But the answer is we need uh, merged business models. I go th back to what customers need in business models and the innovation that the energy folks do, and I commend them from everything they do, including their CEO uh, predicting all kinds of. Uh, 
you know, ill-fated uh, futures for a lot of folks. But, but the, yeah, I said earlier in the panel, genie, the genie's out of the bottle. Customers now will do all kinds of things, and they'll go to Google and Microsoft and NRG and whoever to get what they want, because now they're understanding it better, and the possibilities are there, and new business models and service providers will emerge. Don't be surprised that Google will be selling energy soon after they're selling fiber for example, right? Just like AT&T and Verizon and Comcast could be selling energy just like any retail energy provider. So those things will be game changers, right? And it, should, it could happen and it probably will happen because it's merging of infrastructure, right? In the end, it's who pays for all, all this, right? So. Well, and so I will say that you know, if, you, if the question is, okay, how do you put the game changers together with industry? industry are you talking about industry, the cons you know, the consumers, the industrial consumers, or just because the, yeah, the, well, I, I'll, I'll take a broader perspective, right? Which is that you know the point of putting everything together really and goes back to what you said, right? I mean, it's to you got to try, you got to do this in a way that brings the costs down, and so part of that is also figuring out what is the value proposition at the end customer level, right? Is there a resilience benefit or corporate sustainability goal benefit or some other, um, you know, just kind of control, um, you know, price risk management, something that provides like a tangible, quantifiable benefit to the customer that then can justify the game changer, which is typically, at least, you know, in the U.S., we're blessed with cheap energy. We really are. I mean, we complain about the cost of gas and all the rest, but, I mean, we're blessed with cheap energy compared to these other places in the world. And so, um, you know, I'll kind of put on my hat and say, okay, look, you know, we, we also need policy that helps to kind of put these things together. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the one comment I was going to make, which is we haven't talked a lot about policy. And we haven't had good energy policy in this country for many years. And we need good energy policy. And other countries that have been successful at uh, really uh, giving consumers what they need and what they want um, have better energy policy than we do. Okay. And we all can work on that together. Want to get another question? Guys, guys we're going to keep rolling got a little bit. We've got five more minutes here because we started late. A lot of late. questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm Nancy Edwards. I'm with Solar Bridge, or a microinverter company based in Austin. Um, what I haven't heard here, what I what I do think about as being the game changer, the game changers of the world are are when, you know, the most exciting, sexy ideas meet uh, cost and availability. Um, what you guys are each from big companies, except for one of you, I think. When you look at your companies, what do you see as you know? What are the game changers that we're not hearing about, you know, from your companies that that you're most excited about? I think for us, um, one of the things that we're trying to work on is packaging and kind of integrating things together into complete solutions for customers, and and that's tough, right? Because I mean, it's easy to be, you know, kind of all right to be a specialist on you know one technology and figure out how to you know, kind of drive that and figure out where the niche markets, right, where it works and you can kind of create a value proposition for the customer. It's much harder for us to kind of go to the mainstream customers, you know, pull everything together and say, all right, we, we want to create a holistic solution for you which gives you the resiliency and the sustainability okay. benefits and then kind of provides you with an economic value proposition as well. So that's where we're working, right? How do we package those solutions together? How do we, how do we, how do we figure out how to do things at the distributed level um, that, that, that work, right? And, um, you know, how do, we, how do we spend our time? Um, customer acquisition, I'll talk about that, is, you know, that's, 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 that's a tough problem, right? It's, it's a, you know, a, a huge portion of any uh, kind of you, clean energy, alternative energy technology companies' um, cost structure, which rarely gets talked about except in the context of solar. Um, so, you know, as far as internal business models, how do we how do we just run our business better so that we can kind of reduce those costs? Looks like we have about five more questions. We're going to run through them. Next one. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most disruptive technology, the one that's finally matured into a truly disruptive technology, is fossil fuels. You know, they're threatening to destroy civilization. And it seems to me that that whole way of approaching things 
hasn't really penetrated the discussion I've been hearing all day long. Because if you're putting a true cost on electricity, where's the cost of carbon? It's not there. So solar, saying solar has to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to beat coal is really not true because coal is threatening to make the planet uninhabitable. What's the true cost of that? So I would love to see that at least discussed and included in the, in the conversation. The other thing I want to say is that in terms of utilities having options, and maybe you can address this, we've been discussing down in San Antonio, I'm Lanny Sinkin of Solar San Antonio. We've been discussing in San Antonio, what about if the utility purchased the solar equipment, leased it to its customers, and got a revenue stream <laughs> instead of feeling like they're, they're being penalized or being cost because people are going solar. Sure. What about those kind of options for the utility to actually get in the game? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. I suggested that earlier, on the cars, on the, the solar panels, on everything, they borrow money cheaply, they can lease it back to you for peanuts. So yes, absolutely, they can do it. They, it's a choice, they can make that choice. So why, why, why don't they? Huh? Why, do, why don't more utilities do that? I have I mean, no idea. Duke, well, Austin, example, Energy, Austin Energy has been always ahead of the curve in so many things. That they own 24% of the thermostats in the homes in Austin, and they can turn them all off right now. So, you know, would they want to own solar panels? Again, it's a, it's a chicken and egg thing of affordability, but utilities borrow money very cheaply and they could own all these things. That, that would be sort of the, the move that they could make to squash any competition. I, I also think it's partly the, mo the business model is uncomfortable for them, having 10,000 separate utility units that they're responsible for operating and maintaining is not a model that they're comfortable with. Well, it's not that they're comfortable, it's very hard to do. And it's hard to do. Yes, sir. Uh, so the question, I wanted to go ahead and, and address the first question yeah, about you know, the, the, uh, the, the cost of carbon and fossil fuels. I mean, the reality is, is whether you're on one side, and I'll, I'll say the word global warming, whether you're on one side of global warming or the other, uh, the philosophy of KLD that we have is just putting pollutants into the atmosphere is a bad thing, period, regardless of which side you're on, right? So that's the reason we're doing what we're doing. What I'm excited about, and I think it was Becky or someone else uh, mentioned, what I'm excited about in technology today is that I'm seeing innovative companies like Westlake get out there and do distributed energy. And the bigger companies, well, even Samsung, I mean, we have a partnership with Samsung because they believe in what we're doing. Yes, they want to sell batteries. I get that, right? <laughs> but they still believe that this is the positive direction to go. So it is actually exists out there. But at the end of the day, it is going to come down to cost. Yes. And we do have to make it cheaper in whatever we do. And we have to do that together to make it happen. And a so policy and regulatory environment that kind of, you know, quantifies those costs and says that we have to bear it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and again, you know, this is Texas, right? So there's a lot of people here who don't believe that these costs are real, but there are a lot of people who do, right? And it has, but the, the one thing is that it is an externality, right? Where the cost is borne by everybody. Mm -hmm. And so without a policy and a regulatory framework that can then kind of capture those and then properly allocate them, or say who's going to pay for them, mm -hmm. it won't happen. Mm -hmm. It's a free That's rider problem. That's true. Let's check another yeah. question. John Cooper Siemens, and I'm shameless plug, co-author of the Advanced Smart Grid in the lobby. Yes, sir. <laughs> he is uh, yeah. my buddy. Yeah. So I've got a provocative question for ETS, the Energy Thought Summit. Um, an implicit assumption in all this discussion is that electricity is a commodity and it needs to be cheaper in order for it to be better. Um, I used to pay $30 for my telecom. I pay around 350 or whatever for this, and I just bought an $800 iPad. What would be the impact in a year from now if electricity were double and the customers went, wow, I love it? Wouldn't that be a game changer? Yes. And what would it take to do that? That's it. People, people wanting to have it because the service is amazing <coughs> and they're getting wooed by the quality of the service, which Today, people don't even think about it. They only call the utility when the power is out. They don't even know who their provider is. And they don't think about using electricity every day. They just shave and heat things and cool things. And, and so it, people need to learn that the, the utilities, the providers need to become service providers. I, I would suggest the other component of value is benefit. Right. And the reason I pay so much more is the benefit so far exceeds that increase in cost. Yeah. I was going to say, you could have got a Google Nexus for 270 or, or a Samsung <laughs> pad for about 450 Yeah, you can go back to what Mark said. You know, these kids are doing this because they want to do, reduce their utility bill. Right. So they're not looking at the benefit of... Of, the, of that utility. They're, right. they're, they're out it's there because right. they want to reduce That's their right. parents' utility bill. There's another question? So on Friday I bought a book and, <laughs> and I hope that it outlines a very game-changing uh, idea in, in electricity. 
generation. And so before I tell you, I tell you the title, I wanted to ask my question, which is, should I bother reading it? So hopefully someone here can speak to that. The title of the book is Thorium, Energy mm -hmm. Cheaper Than Coal. Should I read it? <laughs> I would read it. I think, Absolutely. I think you should read it. So Thorium, so I, I had a guy, when I started my company, I had a guy come to me from Massachusetts, from MIT. He actually, he was a professor and he was long retired. He was a big thorium in the guy. And, and of course, and he was one of these guys that believes we're going to start running on thorium next week. That's never going to happen, right? But thorium is actually a very interesting, it has more energy density than any other fuel that I know of out there. So it is interesting, so I would read it. <laughs> read, read it, come back next year and tell us what it said. Yeah. All right, well maybe, yeah, I'll maybe on the panel there we go. I'll tell you all about it. Next Thanks. question. <laughs> Thanks. Well, better yet, you guys get, should get the author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question. Good afternoon. First of all, great panel. I'm John Lichtenberger here in Austin. I'm a uh, generation developer. And uh, this question is really for Zaina. Uh, good to see you again, first of all. Hi, John. Um, regarding your recent success with uh, achieving energy prices from a utility-scale solar project, sub $50 a megawatt hour, I wanted to ask you, do you see that trajectory continuing in, in terms of the price of the energy of these uh, facilities continuing to decline? And then also, were you able to gain any additional benefit or capability from your project in terms of addressing some of the issues with variable intermittent resources, you know, things like ancillary services and, and other capabilities that help the adoption of renewable technology in our grid? Sure. Um, Zaina, before you answer that one, let me let's, let's make it quick because we're way over time. we got one more question. That's okay. one question. So you it's, get no rebuttals. Go ahead. No more questions. Thank you. That's it. I've already uh, kind of answered that question. So I won't comment as to whether or not that pricing is right. Um, it's not sub-50, um, just, you know, so you know. But it is very, very inexpensive. And there are three ways that we achieve that. Um, it's by reducing financing costs on the debt and equity side, which I've already mentioned today. It's by um, reducing costs in the technology. We've already publicly stated that we're going to get it. We, intend to get to 40 cents a watt for 400 watt panels by 2016. And it's by reducing installation costs for EPC. And also, I mean, ultimately, Texas is relatively uh, less expensive place to develop and install solar energy than many other parts of the country. So all of those things, I think, conspired to get to that pricing. I wouldn't say in any shape or form that that pricing is achievable in, in other parts of, of the United States, certainly not in California, for example. Now, do I see that trajectory um, continuing? I mean, I do think that there will be benefits and uh, reduction in costs, um, just even with the existing technology that we have today. I think there are lots of um, things that we haven't tapped into with respect to uh, maximizing trackers and inverters and things like that. So it's, it's on the cusp, but I don't see that as being uh, huge and certainly not, not predictable. Excellent answer. Last question. That, that, Last that, question. I said no rebuttal, sir. No rebuttal. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Russell Shaver, and I work for Austin Energy, your local, regulated, low-rate, innovative <laughs> electric company. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd also like to say to Mark, I really want Google Fiber in South Austin <laughs> yesterday, so the sooner you can make that happen, the happier I will be. Uh, my question's a little bit out of left field. I haven't heard anything mentioned about water, or more appropriately, the lack of it, um, in the West in general, in Texas in particular, and I'm just curious to hear uh, the panel's opinion on what, how much of a threat you think that is and what effect you think it'll have in the utility, traditional utility. Real yeah. quick, real quick, one answer. I, I would say real quick that this is another reason why distributed generation, especially in natural gas microturbines that don't need any water to create the electrons, will become more and more pervasive. So the, the system of the big power plants with the big lakes and all that, it's a challenge. It's a challenge going forward. So distributed generation, solar doesn't need water, wind doesn't need water, natural gas, microturbines don't need water. That's, that's the answer. And it's, and it's another area where the marketplace, I mean, water is a, a precious thing that we can't live without. So we can never let the marketplace drive the price of water because people have to be able to get water. But the gentleman asked earlier about pricing and externalities associated with global warming. Water consumption could be an externality that was somehow factored into price. 
in a way that advantages the less water intensive energy sources. The problem is it gets into a lot of really uh, complex market because you can't just let the market do that because water might end up being more valuable to an, a utility company to generate electricity than what a consumer who's desperate for water could pay for it. So you can't let the market operate freely there, entirely freely, and so you have to figure out some regulatory process of pricing that in. That's a hard problem to solve. All right.